Um, hi, everybody. I think we can start. Um, so nice to see you all. Well, see your names, at least. <laughs> um, my name is uh, Tulin. I'm the artistic director of SAVAK. And um, for those of you that don't know, I see a lot of new people here. So um, we are a nomadic artist run center based in Toronto. And we work uh, to support um, artists of color and other marginalized artists um, in Turtle Island and across the global south. And we're very happy to be hosting uh, the Black Indian Ocean series by artist Heba Ali. Um, this project is part of our new pedagogical and research platform called Mist Connections, which we just launched um, last month. Uh, the program focuses on bringing together different artistic methodologies, ideas, philosophies, and histories that intersect in unexpected ways. And by doing so, it attempts to arise curiosity and wonder through learning together. The program will run throughout this year and potentially also for next year uh, with projects by artists Annie Wong, Parastu Anushahpur, Aman Sandhu, Serena Lee, and of course, Hiba. Um, each of these projects is actually more of a, like an exploration or a study that will unfold as a series of screenings, conversations, workshops, um, mentoring sessions, and other learning activities. Um, we have a lot more information about the project uh, on our website. Uh, so maybe I'll ask my colleague Sophie to um, uh, put the link for Missed Connections on, in the chat and you can read more about it. Um, and obviously, you know, since all these activities are taking place online, um, we've been thinking how um, can we create like a warm and hospitable space for learning and sharing in the digital sphere these days. It's really difficult, but we still want to keep um, thinking about it and keep trying. So we've also come up with a set of um, propositions or ideas on how like both facilitators and uh, participants and members of the public can, can be uh, in order to create this kind of atmosphere. So we also have this document that we're going to share with you in the chat. It would be great if you can take a look at it. It's a very general kind of document. So every, you know, obviously not everything in it applies to it you know, like this specific format of today, for example, but we'd love to hear your thoughts if you have some ideas or if you've been part of events that have kind of succeeded in creating um, this kind of informal uh, but still generative um, space on the internet. So uh, without further ado, I would like to introduce Hiba to you. Um, Hiba Ali is a digital artist, educator, scholar, DJ, experimental music producer, and curator based across Chicago, Illinois, Austin, Texas, and Toronto, Ontario. Their performances and videos concern surveillance, women of color, and labor. She studies geographies of East African, South Asian, and Arab communities across the Indian Ocean region through music, cloth, and ritual. They conduct reading groups addressing digital media and workshops with open source technologies. She's a PhD candidate in cultural studies at Queen's University in Kingston, Canada. They are an assistant professor of art, new media, artist slash feminist art discourse at the College of Design, Art and Technology, University of Oregon in Eugene, Oregon. She has presented their work in Chicago, Stockholm, Vienna, Berlin, Toronto, New York, Istanbul, Sao Paulo, Detroit, Windsor, Dubai, Austin, Vancouver, and Portland. They have written for C Magazine, The Scene Magazine, New City Chicago, Art Dubai, the State, Van Magazine, Zora, Medium, RTV Magazine, and Topical Cream Magazine. So I will uh, pass it on to Hiba today, who will introduce our guests. Welcome to all of you. And I just want to quickly uh, mention that you know we have an, enough time at the end this time to um, uh, take questions and answers from the audience. So please feel free to like put in your questions as the event rolls, if you think of something and I can read them out to our panelists at the end of the event, or if you prefer to um, read, like speak out your question yourself, then that's also possible. So thank you and Hiba. Thank you, Pauline, for the uh, generous introduction. Um, and 
I'm excited to start our um, second screening for the Black Indian Ocean series that visualizes the histories and futures of African descent communities in the Indian Ocean region through film screenings and generative pedagogy. With each event, um, as with uh, our event today with Dr. Sheila, Sheila S. Walker, um, there would, there'll be a reading and or a media related um, item released um, that is available um, to our Substack and also through our online platforms on social media. Um, and so to, for today's screening, we'll be uh, screening uh, Dr. Uh, Dr. Sheila S. Walker's documentary, Familiar Faces, Unexpected Places, a Global African Diaspora that examines the continued presences and culture practices of the African diaspora in the Americas, in the Pacific Ocean, in the Atlantic, and in the Indian Ocean. So we're really thinking through global African descent communities, uh, cultural practices, and linking through um, the body of the ocean. Um, I, so shortly I will um, screen the um, video and at, pending after the screen, there'll be conversation between ourselves as well as you all. So, um, and in the meantime, as Tolene has um, directed, do leave your questions in the chat. Um, joining us today especially is Jan Janelle. Um, and I will go ahead and read um, both of um, their bios now. So Janelle is, the, is a grandchild of the Great Migration, a Midwestern with Southern inflection. Her practice is rooted within familial and communal aesthetics, looking deeply into bridging self and time as an act of placemaking while using modes of collage, found objects, film, food, and photography. Janelle has programmed film screenings at Filmfront and 6018 North. And we've known each other um, for a long time um, Chicago, uh, because of Chicago. Um, so shout out to Chicago. Um, next, I'd like to introduce um, Dr. Sheila S. Walker, PhD. Um, she is a cultural anthropologist and documentary filmmaker. Um, and she has done field work, lectured and participated in intellectual and cultural events in most of Africa and the global African diaspora, as you will surely see. Um, and I also was lovely detailed, lovely, lovely detailed in um, the article that um, goes along with um, today's events um, of her travels and her research. She is ex an executive director of Afro Diaspora Inc Incorporated, the goal of which is to educate the public about the global African diaspora. Her book, African Roots slash American Cultures, Africa and the Creation of the Americas has a companion documentary, Scattered Africa, Faces and Voices of the African Diaspora. Her book, I'll do my um, best um, uh, Spanish uh, speaking here. Her book, Conciamento desde adentro, Los Afro Sudamericans hablan de, de sus pueblos y sus historias, Conciamento desde adentro, o, Os Afro Sudamericanos, Falam de su povos e sao historias, slash, knowledge from the inside, Afro South Americans speak of their people and their histories. Um, I also said the title in, in Portuguese for those who are wondering. Um, this book features chapters by Afro descendants from all, from all of the Spanish speaking countries in South America. Her most recent documentary is Familiar Faces slash Unexpected Places, a Global African Diaspora, which we will see shortly, which was shown at the United Nations, United Nations as the 2018 Black History Month program for the UN International Decade for People of African Descent. and was sent for showings at UN Information Centers in the Americas, Africa, Asia, and the Pacific and Europe. So uh, without further ado, I will um, go ahead and uh, start the screening.
Most of the people who laid the foundations of the modern Americas were of African origin. Of the 6.5 million people who crossed the Atlantic during the first 300 of the 500-year history of the modern Americas, only 1 million came from Europe. 5.5 million people were brought from Africa during the inhuman commerce and human lives known as the transatlantic slave trade. Africans enslaved in the Americas were forced to do the work of building the European colonies that became the American republics. Some Africans were selected specifically for their technological expertise. Africans had been working with iron for thousands of years, and their descendants continued to make both useful objects and beautiful works of art. You look around the wall here, this is some of my work in that 72 years. I ran in the blacksmith shop to shoe hall. I didn't dream I would be making gifts. African knowledge helped feed the Americas with rice domesticated more than 3,000 years ago in West Africa. U.S. plantation owners asked slave ship captains to bring them skilled rice Negroes. The Portuguese enslaved Africans from what was called the Gold Coast to mine gold in Brazil. They said these Africans, whom they called mining Negroes, had an almost magical luck in finding gold. Luck or expertise? Toda a tecnologia empregada aqui na extração do ouro, ela é devido a esse conhecimento africano. Eles precisaram dessa mão de obra especializada. Então eles vão numa região específica da África, que é a região que a gente chama de Costa da Mina, né? E já tinha grandes reinos no passado que faziam uso desse ouro. Né? É, aí a gente fala do, do reino Achante, né? do re, grande reino do Mali também. Não fosse a presença africana, não fosse o saber e o conhecimento trazido pelos africanos, que embora tenha chegado aqui como mão de obra escravizada, Portugal jamais teria conseguido tirar daqui o volume de ouro que tirou. In Ecuador, descendants of mining Negroes still pan gold and transform it into beautiful creations like those of their African ancestors. By the end of the 19th century, 12 to 15 million Africans had been scattered throughout the Americas. More than 200 million African descendants now live throughout the Americas, some in unexpected places. Los afros ya estamos, estamos visibilizándonos, ¿no? porque obviamente habíamos vivido siempre desde cuando la colonia, pero estábamos como cultos, no, no, no estábamos eh, mostrando nuestra identidad. Pero ahora estamos muy visibilizados ya, en cambio estamos reconocidos por la nueva Comisión Política del Estado, entonces estamos incluidos en, en lo que es eh, Bolivia. Across Africa, people play the game of sophisticated mathematical strategy that in some places is called wari. The game is one of the many elements of their cultures that Africans brought with them to the Americas. 
Wari is still played in the Caribbean, most prominently on the island of Antigua. I asked the Prime Minister to tell me one thing that Africans in Antigua have something tangible that they have now that they brought from Africa. And a woman shout out in the crowd, Wari! <laughs> Jawara, who was a math teacher in Antigua, brought his knowledge and skills to the United States. He makes Wari boards and plays and teaches the game on the street in Harlem. Antiguans believe that Wari is their game. Some, some Antiguans believe that there's no other people on earth that plays Wari. <laughs> so, the object of the game is to capture 25 seeds on the opponent's side of the, of, the, of the board. To make a play, you would take all the seeds up from any one of your houses. So take up, make a choice, and you place one seed in the net and one... Yes, I used to play when I was a child, yes, absolutely. But it's all over when you go to Africa, it's everybody in the street, play. It's very common. Ah, you made it, yes, of course. That's why everybody in Africa play this, because it's very smart. Antigua is the only place where the players are buried with this board. When they died, they made sure that they took one of these um, worry boys to heaven. <laughs> Almost half of the Africans who arrived in the Americas came from the Central African region of the Kingdom of Congo. And some African diaspora communities perpetuate Congo royal pageantry. For centuries, the Congo Kingdom was respected in the Atlantic world as an African Christian kingdom. Such esteem was reflected in European artists' portrayals of Congo diplomats. In the Americas, in spite of slavery, African descendants perpetuated memories of royal traditions from the Kingdom of Congo. This reenactment of a 19th century Congo ceremony begins with a contra dance from European royal courts. And quickly segues into much more African rhythms and movements. Afro-Brazilians in the state of Minas Gerais portray the pageantry of the royal courts of the kings and queens of Congo. Delegations come from afar, seeking blessings from Afro-Brazilian Congo kings and queens. In Panama, Congo ceremonies are less formal and more playful, with Congo royals dancing exuberantly to drumming of African origin. Some people characterize Panama's Congo celebrations as a parody of the Spanish monarchy. A more plausible interpretation is that, as elsewhere in the Americas, they represent a continuity of the Congo monarchy. But the African diaspora does not just exist in the Atlantic world of the Americas. It is global. 
On South Pacific islands that Europeans called Melanesia for the melanin-rich skin of their inhabitants, people whose ancestors settled there thousands of years ago identify with global African diasporan culture. Africans were enslaved on Indian Ocean Islands to work on plantations, as in the Americas. Africans were also enslaved across the Mediterranean Sea to Turkey during the Ottoman Empire. Bu insanları bir araya toplamanın, bu insanlarla bir arada konuşmanın, bu insanlarla birçok sorunu paylaşmanın yolunun dernek olduğunu bildiğim için dernek girişimi olarak yola çıktım ve 2006 sonlarında Afrikalılar Kültür Dayanışma ve Yardımlaşma adı altında Yedinci Dana Bayramı başlamıştır. Tüm halkımıza Dana Bayramı bir yıl boyunca sağlık, mutluluk ve bol verim vermesini dilerim. Herkesin Dana Bayramı'nı kutlarım. Renklerimiz bir ya. Renklerimiz bir. Onun sebepleri. Karımız kaynıyor. Same color. Our blood is is like same. All the black people are celebrated, and she's saying to anyone, we are coming all together. We are seeing each other, talking and sharing something. So she she's happy about that. Has the market? Yes. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. India offers a variety of African diasporan experiences that contrast with and complement those of the Americas. Some people are come from Sudan, some people are come from Ethiopia. In Africa, my father told me that they came from Sudan. Now my father's, father's, grandfather's, they're all from Africa. Now they live here, here we have become like Indians now. So many cities are India, in India. We are uh, African Indians. Tens of thousands of Afro-Indians, known as Siddhis, whose ancestors came from East Africa, form distinct communities in several states. Until India's independence, Siddhis were palace guards for the Nizams, the rulers of the princely state of Hyderabad.
In Ahmedabad, in Gujarat, the Siddi Said Mosque, known for its lacy carved stone windows, bears the name of its 16th century creator, who came from Northeast Africa. On Maharashtra's Konkani coast, Siddis were famous for centuries for controlling maritime traffic from their fort on Janjira Island, which is now a national landmark. In Karnataka, Siddis whose ancestors came from Southeast Africa live in rural areas. We Africans, they were brought here and they were stay. They just spread out in the forest. They celebrated the election of President Barack Obama, whom they consider one of their own people, proudly claiming him as an American Siddi. Wherever they were enslaved, Africans and their descendants resisted bondage. Centuries ago, some of them, referred to as Maroons, escaped to inaccessible places and created autonomous communities. Haiti's citadel is the world's greatest monument to the triumph of an enslaved population. Haitians defeated Napoleon's army, the most powerful army in Europe, to free themselves and create the world's first independent black republic and the first government to outlaw slavery. On Mauritius and Reunion Island in the Indian Ocean, people enslaved by the British and French escaped to remote highlands to form free communities in rugged environments. I think the real cirque of Maronnage at the Reunion is the cirque of Bafat. Aujourd'hui, nous dans le site culturel, le paysage culturel du monde, c'est qu'à l'époque, durant l'époque de l'esclavage, durant la période française et britannique, si y en a à différents moments, un groupe d'esclaves qui s'est sauvé des picots de Banmet pour venir trouver refuge dans la montagne là. Et dans un document historique, avec une interview qui nous fait avec Ben Dimoun qui fait de nous qui c'est là, ce qu'il nous appelle la République des Marrons qui s'est installé dans la montagne. Là. Alors, ça, tout ça est bien important parce que c'est le combat des marrons pour la, affirmer le statut d'être libre et d'être humain. C'est un combat qui est le premier phénomène dans l'île Maurice. Nous considérons ben, nous ben, dans cette marron comme ben, une précurseur, ben, une pionnier dans la lutte People in Colombia's Palenque de San Basilio celebrate their maroon heritage. Leader, founder of the Palenque, not only the Palenque San Basilio, but the man who, between 37 and 37 men and women, who were embarked there in the city of Cartagena. Huyeron hacia los montes y fundaron el Palenque San Basilio. El amor palenquera se caracteriza por ser trabajador, con su palangana a salir para Cartagena o otras ciudades de Colombia o otro país como Venezuela, Ecuador. Soy un hombre de virtud, digo que Dios me dio. The marimbula is a version of the Central African instrument called mbira, sansa, and other names. Yeah. 
Jamaica honors its freedom-seeking heritage by featuring its national heroine, Maroon leader Queen Nanny, on the bill that people call a nanny. And in the United States, Harriet Tubman led hundreds of people from slavery to freedom along secret paths of the Underground Railroad. Now she has public highways in her name. Spirituality is the realm in which African diasporan communities have best maintained ancestral worldviews and behaviors. In Salvador, capital of Brazil's state of Bahia, African divinities, the Orishas of the Yoruba people of Nigeria and Benin in West Africa, characterize the city's cultural and spiritual life. In spiritual ceremonies and secular performances such as this one, the Orishas dance cosmic choreographies, portraying their roles in nature and human life. Across the Indian Ocean, Afro-descendant communities also venerate spiritual beings of African origin. Baba Gore, the African saint of the Siddhis from Gujarat, comes from Abyssinia, or Ethiopia, in Northeast Africa. Baba Gore arrived in the village of Ratampur as an agate merchant 800 years ago. Baba Gore also had great spiritual powers, and Siddhis built a shrine in his honor. As guardians of the shrine, they share Baba Gore's blessings with fellow Siddhis and with other Indians. Baba Gore is now worshipped not only by Siddhis, but also by other Indians of various faiths. Because Iberian Catholics dominated the enslaving of Africans in the Americas, several Afro-descendant communities worship black Catholic saints. Patron saint of Palermo in Sicily, St. Benedict's parents, enslaved in Italy, were from Ethiopia. Como somos de la diáspora africana, entonces queremos conocer también las festividades que cada pueblo o región o territorio del, de esta Suramérica festejan a sus santos negros. In adopting these saints, Africans and their descendants also adapted them to an African understanding of how to celebrate them joyously. Balthazar, also from Northeast Africa, was the African of the three kings who the Bible said took gifts for the birth of Jesus. Es un santo negro, como dice ella, como nosotros, que, eh, que, que nos identifica en realidad porque eh, es un santo que nosotros consideramos que es un santo de los afrodescendientes. No puede ser de otro color, sino como nosotros. En la community chapel, Balthazar carries an incense burner, representing his gift of precious incense. Another segment of the Afro-Paraguayan community called Cambacua their name coming from the Bakamba people of the Republic of Congo, celebrates a different version of the saint. El Santo Negro, como ellos decían, que es San Baltasar. 
uno de los tres reyes más. Hace milagro. Hay gente que si ya le pidieron y le cumplieron el milagro, por ejemplo, si alguien está enfermo, le, le pide y le, le, hace, le pide una, un milagro y le cumple una promesa que se recupere esa persona. This Balthazar carries not an incense burner, but a drum, called by the Central African Bantu term kandombe, that also designates the community's music and dance. Le gusta todo lo que es el tambor, el baile, todo eso le gusta. At midnight before Three Kings Day, January 6th, the Kambakwa begin to celebrate their African saint. The Kambakwa also organize an annual festival attended by thousands of people at which they honor their African saint. Canchimaledo, vamos a Canchimaledo. Bueno, San Martín con el poder de Dios, el Señor le ha dado el poder y él hace mucho milagro a nuestra a nuestra raza. Porque hay muchas personas que sí de verdad les ha hecho milagro y la gente por eso cree mucho en él. Vamos a Canchimaledo, vamos a Canchimaledo a buscar a San Martín para celebrar el cumpleaños de él. Saint Martin de Porres the only black saint born in the Americas, is famous in his native Peru for his miraculous healing. In river communities in Esmeraldas province in Peru's neighboring Ecuador, Saint Martin also saves people from drowning. The communities organize a river procession to Canchimalero, partying their way to Saint Martin's party. Las balsas hacen como forma de concurso, cuál es la mejor balsa, cuál es la que mejor tiene mejor presentación. Entonces, se, cada, por decir, cada parroquia se encarga de que su balsa sea bonita para que tenga buen éxito. The usual quiet village of Canchimalero explodes when thousands of people converge to celebrate their saint. Las personas se, se comprometen, ¿no? Por algo bueno que les haya hecho, por un milagro. Este, yo había viajado en muchos países en África, bastante. Pero la vida, celebrar con alegría, eso es típicamente africano. Esta manera de vivir con la fiesta, con la alegría, eso es puramente africano, la danza. I'm Sheila Walker, and I'm a cultural anthropologist. My field research with communities of African origin around the world, reveals ways in which people, knowledge, and skills from Africa became foundations of new societies. It highlights how African diasporan communities transformed memories of life in Africa to create dynamic cultural forms that continue to enrich global civilization.
That was amazing. Um, thank you so much to Dr. Shreel Swapper for making this um, pioneering and brilliant work connecting the global African diaspora across ocean and time. And I just, and just all, and then rewatching also knows all of the, the the research that has gone into this, both personal and academic, I can only imagine. Um, um, so, uh, so now we'll start with some questions that uh, we have prepared. Um, I'll, I'll start with um, the first one here. So, so Dr. Sheila, I would like to also um, uh, invite also Janelle um, to add to this as well as their capacity as a uh, programmer and thinking through this. So uh, what influences, um, Dr. Sheila Walker, what influences you uh, led you to the work of culture anthropology and why was it important for you to connect the global African diasporas across the Indian, o Indian Ocean, Atlantic and Pacific Oceans? Um, so, yeah. Okay. Well, I always wanted to go places. And I, I just knew that the world was bigger than my little town in New Jersey. And I was lucky that I had an aunt who lived in Chinatown in New York. So I knew there were other people. And I knew that there were people who looked different and who ate different food and who had different language. There's a lot of writing in Chinatown. And I was learning how to read and write and I couldn't find any of the letters I knew. So I was just intrigued as a four year old. And my aunt didn't have kids and didn't have a television. So my big screen television was the window looking out on Chatham Square with all those interesting people. Um, so I wanted to go to China, but you know, I was four, so. I couldn't go. And uh, I chose to go to a college that had a junior year abroad program so that I could be guaranteed that at some point I'd get to go someplace. And uh, the junior year abroad program was, of course, in Europe uh, at that point. You know, why would anybody go anyplace else? But before oh. <laughs> going to France, of course, I found out about the experiment in international living that had a program that summer in Cameroon. So I had an alternative to Europe. And just to make my experience more challenging, um, I went to the, I was in the French speaking part of Cameroon. So I used my best college French. <laughs> that was a big challenge. But so that's how I got to go someplace. And at that point, we US African-Americans were being told that we had no culture. And we were the only ethnic group in the, in the United States to have no culture. Well, I didn't really like that. Uh, and fortunately, while I was staying with this wonderful family in Cameroon that was very proud of their culture, very knowledgeable about their culture, and their culture is very rich. I was with the Bamoon people in the capital of their kingdom. And so I'd never met a king before. You know, we didn't have a lot of those in Jersey. Uh, and the father of the king in question had created a writing system for his language, had written books in his language. And right now I'm trying to read one of those books. It's not so easy. Um, and so there, it was a very rich culture. It had two museums in this little town in Africa. So this was the era of Tarzan and everything I experienced had nothing to do with this Tarzan reality. Mm -hmm. <laughs> I um, experienced cultural stuff that I thought, hmm, I recognize that. And so the fact of living with this African family when I was 19, so therefore open to new experiences, convinced me that, oh, I had been lied to. You know, we did have a cultural heritage. And I met an anthropologist and he, what he was doing sounded like the way I wanted to travel. And so I had thought, well, you know, I'll go, I'll study for uh, political science and I'll join the US diplomatic corps and that'll be how I'll travel. I never really understood political science. I was looking for the people and the culture and you know, that's not what it's about. Um, so I met an anthropologist in Fumban who was doing research for the basic book on the Bamoon kingdom. And I also met some US diplomats and my reaction to that was, uh-uh, I don't want to, uh, no, I don't want to work with these guys. Um, my best symbol for why I didn't want to work with those guys, and they were guys, of course, they were white males, um, was I asked one of them who'd only been in Cameroon, which is a very rich country agriculturally. So I asked him what he thought about the food. And he said he thought he may have had some after sure. one few years, <laughs> thought he may have had some. So I asked him what he thought he may have had. And what he, <laughs> he had had some grilled beef. 
<laughs> and I'm sure he had his servant prepare it in his, you know, big fancy U.S. house. It's street food. You're supposed to eat it in the street with your fingers and dip it in some pepper. I'm sure he didn't have any pepper, <laughs> you know. But so that's symbolic of me uh, as to why anthropology won out. And um, but at that point, you know, I was just kind of interested in Africa, the connections with us and the United States. You know, we didn't, I didn't have a sense of the larger African diaspora in the Americas. And so I began to get that gradually by going to a conference in Colombia, at which I met other Spanish speakers, Portuguese speakers from the rest of the Americas. Then I worked in Somalia for a short period of time. And I remember standing on the beach of Mogadishu looking east. Mm -hmm and thinking, wow, I don't know, I have no idea what's on the other side of that water, none. Then there was a conference in, in India in um, 2006 on the African diaspora in Asia. And I'm so excited about that opportunity to get to know more of the African diaspora someplace else that I almost bought a ticket for a year too early. But that was, you know, that's where I got the other pieces of the African diaspora access to the other pieces. And um, so I went to several places in India and um, I met Beroz who's on the, <laughs> on the call and who was nice enough to take me to some places in India on that occasion and on another. Um, I also met people from Turkey, from uh, the Indian Ocean Islands. And so I got a sense of there's so much more to this African diaspora and world than I know. And um, I'm not a tourist, so I need to know somebody who can let me really experience the culture. And what I think is wonderful about um, having gotten to know the other side of the world was the similarities and the differences. And there are both, um, like the phenomenon of marooning, uh, escaping from enslavement. Well, I only associated that with the Americas. I went to Reunion Island and had to stay there for a month <laughs> because I, has, I was invited to a conference in the Seychelles. Some folks in, on Reunion were going to have a conference to which they want to invite me, wanted to invite me, but they said, we can't afford for you to go home and come back. So you just have to stay with us. And I thought, what am I gonna do on this little piece of France where I can't even go swimming because there are too many sharks uh, for all this time? turned out to be fascinating, marooning. It's a capital of marooning. Uh, the center of the island is called Leo, the highlands, marooning. The, there are three um, settlements, let's call them there. And they're all named after Malagasy maroons. One is only, well, two are accessible by car if you're daring. And one is not, there's no road whatsoever. It's accessible either by foot or helicopter. So obviously, you know, <laughs> how was I going to get there? But it's called Mafat, which in Malagasy, um, or what a Malagasy language means fatal. Like, look, we escaped uh -huh. here. Don't even try to come get us, okay? <laughs> it will be fatal. <laughs> really reminded how marooning really ties ties the global African diaspora from the Americas. Um, to the Indian Ocean as well, uh, especially because of the history, I believe, in uh, in Karnataka of um, um, African descent communities living in the woods, um, and how um, it's really a, a global pull for African descent communities for for freedom and what that what that means. I I want to um, uh, also give Janelle the um, invite to uh, weigh in and uh, yeah. Uh, yeah, so uh, this is all like so like I think the beauty of uh, Hiba inviting me into this conversation with Dr. Sheila is it has allowed me to expand about my own personal notions of like black identity and my relationship to being uh, an African descendant from uh, Atlantic slave trade and thinking about in being in dialogue with Hiba and your identity as a Afro descendant from um, India and Pakistan. Um, so I'm just like so thankful to be in this conversation and thinking about like naming of, of like locations and sites. And um, 
I'm my family's from like the Mississippi uh, Delta region, and there's actually um, a city uh, near uh, the area where my um, my mom's side is from, uh, which is called uh, Refuge. And I think about I'm thinking a lot about what does it mean for a community called Refuge when that was an area of uh, tension of violence and of um, exploitation of labor as well as there's another community called the homie and all the people <laughs> in that community were known to come from the Dahomey kingdom and those are where the, the descendants of that um of those folks came from so I'm just like I'm really thinking about like the power of the naming of these places and putting the faces to the people where they come from yeah Wow, it's exciting to hear about Dahomey because there are some places in the Americas where the Africanity is flagrant in one way or the other. And one of those ways in Panama is the naming of places. Panama must have a good 100 African place names, Mandinga, Congo, Malambo, Mukambo, uh, ethnic names, Juan, Bran, uh, Sape, um, Juan Bran, Juan Sape. Um, <laughs> Cabongo. So there are so many of them. Uh, but the, they don't know what those names mean. It's been very disappointing for us researchers to say, well, why is it called Gu Guinea, La Guinea? Oh, there were a lot of Guineos. Bananas. Hmm. Africa, the whole place was referred to by some Europeans as Guinea, right? And they're thinking this place is named for a banana. <laughs> That's a really important point about uh, locating names and the histories that are attached to naming and terming and what becomes sort of like the mainstream, you know, definition and what becomes this, the sort of definition at the margins and pulling from the margins and centering and centering what, what those definitions are. And that really dovetails into uh, the, next uh, the next question we have prepared. Um, uh, why in, in your travels and why, uh, what have you witnessed in terms of cultural anthropology and ideas on decolonization of the, the practice? Because there's like older, you know, roots, et cetera, to what the field is. And so I, I, would, be, I would love to learn more about how um, cultural anthropology in relation to decolonization practice operates for you, for you Sheila. <laughs> Well, cultural anthropology remains to be further decolonized. It is a colonial science that was characterized by Kathleen Goff as the child of imperialism and the handmaiden of colonialism. Had I known that, I might not have been one. But I figured that, you know, we could use it for, I mean, the, the tools are fine. You know, it's the, the worldview that's a problem. But we could use the tools to learn about, our, about ourselves for our own reasons. And I was part of the founding of the Association of Black Anthropologists. And we created a newsletter that we called News from the Natives because we, you know, once the real anthropologists couldn't travel around the world so easily in the new decolonized countries, they were not so welcome to go there and define somebody else's reality. So where did they find some new natives, some nearby natives, African-American communities and major mm -hmm. cities with big universities that owned land in those communities. I went to the University of Chicago. The natives were two blocks away, you know. Mm -hmm. But so I learned that I was a native, I was to be studied. I wasn't supposed to study other folks. And uh -huh. my, <laughs> my dissertation advisor, when I told him I would like to do research in Africa or someplace in the African diaspora, because that's what interested me. Plus I thought that the people might relate to me better. He informed me that no, they wouldn't. An anthropologist is an anthropologist and he would have as good a reception as I had had with this family in Cameroon. When I told later visiting that family, when I told them that they said, what? <laughs> we received you as a daughter. We would have seen him as a colonizer. <laughs> so, but um, you know, I found that the tools have been great hanging out with people and asking them questions and trying to learn about their cultures and seeing, you know, with respect to the diaspora, all these interesting similarities and interesting unique characteristics, for example. I mean, India is such a great uh, mirror 
for the Americas and that there were in Af there are what there are, there are people um, there were historic Afro Indians who didn't go there involuntarily who were not enslaved or if they were became unenslaved and became rulers uh, became people of power so we need to know that that's one of the possibilities and we in the Atlantic world also need to you know know that we're not the only we're not the only game on the planet <laughs> there other ways of seeing this that are enriching and allow us to say, oh, I never thought about that. Wow, well, let's look at things from that perspective. So I think that um, this is such an exciting moment for all this, you know. Uh, and when I thought about all those colonizer statues mm -hmm. <laughs> being thrown into the river and such, wow, you know. Um, and then I always think about that great philosopher, Bob Marley, emancipate yourself from mental slavery. None of our, none but ourselves can free our minds. <laughs> that he got from Marcus Garvey, but he's saying it, so. Yes, that's such an important point that you're, make, that you're making, Sheila, about subject position, because often, you know, in study, even in contemporary times, in studies and histories, the subject position of the writer or the filmmaker or the artist is so far removed from the communities that they're defining or writing about that often um, the quote unquote studied communities don't even know what is being said until, you know, not at all, first of all, or, or many, many years later, and they read that and said, I didn't say that. That's not what I meant. Um, and so there's, um, you know, and so it's, it becomes a very um, hierarchy based um, uh, exchange that what that that is, um, I mean, hierarchy is always present, but it's kind of fortified in when the subject person, the person who was doing the research or on the subject is so far removed. And that's one thing I really appreciate about your, your work is that there is a connection and, and, uh, and a goal of not, um, uh, you know, you, it's not centering American ways of thinking through the world um, and thinking through ideas of the global African diaspora that's connected to spiritual practice, practice of belonging and, uh, and community um, through time and space. Uh, and that one was really um, powerful um, for me as well. Um, so I don't know, General, if you'd like to add anything, I'd also like to, and I know that, not to put you on the spot, but I know that um, um, Perosji and Jasmine are on the call. So if there's something comes up that do, does strike you to unmute uh, and say something, I welcome that. So I'd like to just uh, invite, invite um, Janelle as well. Yeah, um, I think this has been a conversation that uh, me and Hitha have had uh, personally as well, just like, thinking about like I think the beauty of having BIPOC people be a part of anthropology or arts or whatever field of study that they choose um is yes there's kind of this bridging that happens that let's say the white male wouldn't have with like the Cameroon family um that you're kind of able to be in the um the inner immediate person in kind of the experience. Um, and I've been thinking a lot about my own, I don't know, like the, the, the Black American experience is oftentimes um, centered when it comes globally to like Black experience. Um, and I'm trying to figure out ways um, in which we can kind of like destabilize that in the sense of like, not like hiding, but like uh, ushering people along with us in a sense, if that makes sense. <laughs> it really does. I mean, the let's see, we have learned that hegemonic attitude much too well. And I don't think it serves us particularly. You know, I was as you were talking, I was thinking of um, this book that I edited. So after editing an initial book, uh, African Roots, American Cultures, Africa and the Creation of the Americas, it was main, mainly scholars who had attended a conference that I organized on the African diaspora in the modern world. And that was just Atlantic world, because that's all I knew then. Well, then I totally lost my mind and did another book in Spanish after I had a whole year of Spanish in a previous century with a group of Spanish speaking Afro-South Americans who had no training as researchers. And some of them, you know, their Spanish was not the greatest. And I became an expert in putting accents on words. 
But I thought, well, why did I do that? Why didn't I just write about them? Because it's so much easier to just write the story than to ask people to write their own story and then you've got to edit it. Who, but th my thought was, who am I to tell their stories? You know, I mean, what, what would I be doing? I would be telling other people what they told me. Well, why not just facilitate their telling their own stories? And so we called um, the, the first conference Generating Knowledge from the Inside, uh, Afro-South Americans Tell Their Own Stories. And, um, but they generated, I didn't. We, uh, I got a grant when I went to teach at Spelman that was for um, HBCUs, Historically Black Colleges and Universities, and Afro-Latin, such a strange word, a dead European language. But anyway, that was the word. Um, and I thought, I can't write, a, I can't, propose a project about them. I'm from Jersey, right? What do I know? And so I invited a colleague from Venezuela uh, and he and I wrote a structure. We came up with the basic themes you need to know to understand the diaspora in the Americas. And then we invited people from all the Spanish speaking countries in South America to come gather, learn a methodology, get the sense that they had a story and to and help them define the elements of that story. And then they wrote their own pieces. I mean, it wasn't easy. It certainly wasn't easy for me, the editor. But um, I mean, they, Juan Angola Maconde, my favorite name from the Americas, from Bolivia, you saw him. When I met him, he said, I'm Juan Angola Maconde from Bolivia. We don't have any African culture. And I said, Angola Maconde? You got two African names and no African culture? How you do that? <laughs> you invented that? <laughs> no, there are a lot of Angolas. OK. Um, <laughs> But so these folks, they, you know, they, their educational system, I mean, if we have been lied to here and we have access to so much information, they have access to much less information in Portuguese or Spanish. Their educational system just says, y'all don't exist. <laughs> you know? There are no Afro-Bolivians, Afro-Paraguayans, Afro-Argentinians, according to their national myth. So I figured, okay, well, my job is just to give them access to telling their stories. And when it came time for me to write the introduction to the book, I thought, oh, well, you know, I'll just look at how well they have followed our orders and written according to the themes we gave them. Well, that didn't happen. <laughs> they came up with their own themes. And I then had to adjust to what they found important in their own societies. And that was a lot harder than I'd expected it to be, but it seemed to be the only honest thing to do. And I think the results are just what the results ought to be, that my job was to bring them together and then try to tie together the ideas that they generated from the inside. So <laughs> that's what um, your comment about uh, both of your comments about the hierarchy. Uh, you know, I mean, I was supposed to be hierarchical and say, look, I got some money, let me bring you all together. Okay, give me all the data and I'm gonna write about you. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I couldn't do that. It just, I mean, it never even occurred to me. <laughs> yeah, that, go ahead. That leads into like the next question in like, in what ways do you feel the narratives of African diaspora in the Indian Ocean region can gain a wider audience? within their home countries and globally? Yeah, within their home countries. Well, it, in some places, particularly on the islands of the Indian Ocean, the Mascarenes, uh, Seychelles, Mauritius, and Reunion, there are groups that are making an effort to tell their stories in all the islands, like Seychelles. They have a Creole Institute, and Creole is their national language. Um, I think Haiti may have Creole as a national language, I'm not sure, but Seychelles, that's the national language. They also speak French and English, so they've got a lot of, <laughs> a lot of possibilities. Um, you know, some of those people, as a result, essentially, of our research in the Americas, are beginning to figure out how to identify cultural elements that they have that they never thought about as yeah. being diasporic being of African origin, because obviously they weren't told that. Um, but for example, in, uh, I was just, I've just been in contact with a friend from the Seychelles who runs the Creole Institute, who said that, and I think this is really pretty interesting, a, uh, a terminology for a dark 
strong black woman is, you think you're the king, the queen of Congo? Well, that's hmm. pretty interesting. Now this is the Indian Ocean, right? And Congo is the African term that's most used in the Americas. In Panama, for example, there's a fish called Congo, uh, there's a pepper called Congo, there's an ant called Congo, there's a wasp called Congo, as well as rivers, places. And uh, I, I suspect that there are more uses than I know. And I wish I could just ask people, but so many people haven't looked or don't have the lens for, to recognize things. And as a result of my first intense African experience and many subsequent ones, and I lived in Ivory Coast and traveled all around in various ways, uh, you know, I can see stuff that if you haven't had experiences, you can't see, you don't have the lens. And just reading a book is not gonna give it to you. <laughs> Cause it's just not all there. We need to do a lot more research on this issue. Plus, I was watching um, some Sidi uh, Goma from Gujarat, and I was thinking, wow, you know, we in the Americas, right, the, the cultures that, that African descendants have um, interacted with are, first of all, other African cultures and European cultures of various sorts, indigenous cultures of various sorts in different parts of the Americas. But when I watched Iqbal playing his drum <laughs> and singing Salmini, I thought, wow, you know, that's a different connection. Um, that's totally different from anything anybody would do in the Americas because the Africans in the Americas met different people from those Africans who went the, in the other directions. Uh, the Africanity of the Persian Gulf, they're African descendants in all those countries, and some of them are high status individuals. Uh, and apparently their identity as Arabs trumps their identity as African descendants, which is okay, you know, that's a, a consciousness issue. But I went to um, Abu Dhabi, and I know you're not supposed to pounce on the natives right away and say, hey, can I take your picture? But I did. <laughs> and I'm, uh, I, I stayed with a friend who's really from Guyana, grew up in Brooklyn, of course. And I said, I'm interested in the African diaspora. He said, oh, I don't know anything about it. But he brought home a friend of his, an Afro-Emirati. And I <laughs> asked the Afro-Emirati two things. Any of your ancestors dive for pearls? Yeah, of course. Well, who dove for pearls there, as well as in Panama, as well as in Nicaragua and the Pearl Lagoon, um, as well as in Venezuela off the island of Marguerite? African descendants, people from the area of Ghana who were known for their underwater diving skills. Uh, I also asked the same um, Emirati if he knew anything about the czar, the trans-based spiritual phenomenon. He said, oh yeah, I'm a drummer. Well, those are two cultural phenomena that totally identified him. But then I went back to, I was teaching at Spelman then, and I went back to Spelman and I told the class that I had just been to the Emirates and you know, I, I learned a little about Afro-Emiratis. And I threw, threw two photos on the table and said, all right, who's the brother from Brooklyn and who's the Arab terrorist? Because this was shortly after 9-11, so you know, Arabs were terrorists, right? So who's the Arab terrorist and who's the, the brother from Brooklyn? I'm like, well, I don't know. I'm like, no, come on, racial profiling. You could tell a terrorist, can't you? <laughs> no, they couldn't figure out which one was the, uh, <laughs> the presumed terrorist <laughs> and which one was the brother from Brooklyn who was presumed not to be a terrorist. Well, how are we supposed to know? I said, well, just look at them. <laughs> they just looked at them and they said, well, this one. This one what? Well, then the other one. <laughs> so, you know, in, in India, I remember being in Karnataka with these Afro-Indians who were looking at me and saying, oh, you know, she must be one of our people. <laughs> so that goes both ways. And on Reunion Island, I went to the market right after Barack Obama was uh, elected president. And I said, and we, we partied on Reunion because, you know, 
we all now had a president. The Turkish, the Afro, Afro Turks, like, yes, he's our president. Mm. And so I told people in the market, Reunion Island, the other side of the world, that I was from the country of President Barack Obama. What was the response? Oh, you're from Kenya. <laughs> so decenter the Atlantic world. They weren't thinking about the United States. <laughs> Sheila, we have some questions coming from the audience. Good. Um, this one relates a little bit to the beginning of um, to what Janelle was also saying. <clears throat> and it's from Indu, and she's asking, are there scholars from the African continent who study the African diaspora? If so, how do these how do those scholars understand diaspora? <laughs> That's a great question with respect to India, because the other person with whom I discovered India, our Afro-Indian cultures, other than Beroz from Mumbai, was Pashington Obeng, who is a Ghanaian historian who did research and wrote a book about African uh, Afro-Indians in Karnataka. And I thought that was great because, you know, he would have what, you know, however, colonial his education was, and it had to be because he's from Ghana. He still was a Ghanaian with some sort of home perspective on these Afro-Indians. And so, and he said that, and he, he said that he was looking at them through his own African eyes and discovering African ways of looking at the world, ways that they themselves, you know, couldn't identify as African because how would they know? Um, there are, uh, yeah, there, there need to be more people from you know, across the diasporic stuff. <laughs> you know? yeah. My real desires, there was, uh, unfortunately, he just died. There was a wonderful guy from Benin who, who was very, he was mo my most diasporic African friend. Um, he had taught Yoruba to people in, this, in the Yoruba spiritual community in Bahia who'd never been to Africa. So he was like their African. And he had some wonderful experiences of his ability to identify cultural stuff in the Americas. And somebody like me would never be able to identify because I don't have the right lens for that. But he was at a, um, <clears throat> a funeral ceremony in Bahia, a Yoruba, well, sort of Yoruba, because then the religion gets a little more Pan-African. But he was at a Yoruba, what was presumably a Yoruba spiritual, uh, uh, a funeral celebration for someone of high status. And he's, he was a linguist, a Yoruba linguist of Yoruba. Um, and so he could say, oh, oh, now they're singing in Abiyo Kuta. Oh, now they're singing in Ijasha. So different Yoruba dialects he could identify because the different Orishas came from different parts of Yoruba land. And then suddenly he didn't understand anything. And he fortunately was with somebody from Central Africa, uh, Central Africa, a Congo, a Mu Congo, part of the Ba Congo kingdom. And the Congo said, my turn now. <laughs> so now they were singing in Bantu languages because you have to sing for all the ancestors. You can't leave anybody out or they'll be mad. Um, and I've been in places where I just wished to have the right African. It can't be any African, you know, it's gotta be an African who's got the proper knowledge for that place. But I was in a, a village in Ecuador and I just wished I had maybe some Africans from different parts of the continent to recognize things, uh, recognize that fish trap that's called Katanga, a Bantu word, uh, recognize words in the Spanish that these folks were speaking. Um, so there's not enough, but there's some. Okay, great. Um, we have more questions coming in, which is great. Um, Mira was asking about the mosque in Ahmadinejad, but uh, Behrouz and um, Jasmine are chiming in on that conversation. Okay. So since we only have like 10 minutes left, I'll move on to other questions. This one is from Adeline Favela. Being that culture is hyper-present in language and the way people communicate in your experiences and research abroad, did you find any similarities within the linguistic composition between brackets, phonetic, morphological, et cetera, of these communities, of these communities across the diaspora? Well, I hate that I don't speak any Indian language because I'm sure I was missing stuff, except that I remember this word that had to do with hair that sounded like kingri. And I thought, hmm. And I ran that by a friend who's a Mukongo 
who said, hmm, <laughs> there was a similar word in, in Kikongo that had to do with hair. And um, so I think linguistics are essential um, because you, you know, there's stuff that, that people are not conscious of, but there it is. Uh, I was trying to learn uh, some Martinican Creole. And one of the things I noted was two things that I'm aware of from US African-American English. The dropping of the first um, syllable, écoute, listen, écoute, uh, demande, mande. Like in African-American English, I've been buked and I've been scorned. We buke. So there's the loss of that initial uh, syllable. The R, the R gets lost in, in uh, Creole, in French Creole in the uh, Caribbean. Uh, dormir, domi. Uh, and then I thought, hmm, well, let me listen with my African-American ears. I'm going to the stove. I'm gonna close the door. <laughs> so the R is lost. And so I'm convinced that there is more of that kind of phenomenon throughout the, the global African diaspora, but you have to have the proper uh, what, auditory lens to be able to pick up those similarities. Thank you, Sheila. Okay, I think we can actually go back to um, Mira's question again, and maybe also invite Behruz and um, Jasmine to chime in for the last few minutes. We still have 10 minutes. Mm -hmm. So I'll read it out, Mira unless you wanna, you wanna speak out your question, but I can read it out as well. So Mir is saying, I'm curious about the Sidi Sayed Mosque in Ahmedabad, India, an African Indian cultural erasure. I've been there, it is gorgeous and I have read about it, but I'm shocked to learn that it was built by a Sidi and someone of African descent. Of course, the name says it. I see though that it is claimed as, her as a heritage monument of India and that African history is distant. It was intact, visit, it was intact visited by Modi along with the Japanese prime minister, which of course did nothing to highlight its African heritage. Do you know if this mosque is a living mosque uh, for the Sidi community? And then she follows up, like how does the community reconcile the national forgetting of the African Indian history of this mosque? Um, Jasmine, you have actually witnessed the ceremonies there. So why don't you address it first? Hi, Sheila. Hi, so nice to see you. you. Yeah. <laughs> Yeah. Hi, Dr. Walker, and hi, Veroshti. Very hi. nice to see you both, and thank you again to Hiba for organizing this um, wonderful event. And nice to also hear your reflections, Janelle. I appreciated learning from you as well. Uh, so, as far as the celebrations around Siddi Saeed, uh, members of the Siddi community gather around his mosque once a year to venerate his memory. They view him as an ancestor saint of their community. So it's through this very public uh, celebration by which they march through the streets and they perform musical instruments of African origin that they reconcile this public erasure of the African history of, of uh, the Sidi Said Mosque. Mm -hmm. Very nice, thank you, Jasmine. Yeah, I want to thank Hiba too and Janelle and my dear friend, Sheila. Always <laughs> such a pleasure to see you and we have to meet in India again. Absolutely. Yeah. <laughs> You know, I look at Beros. What about Janjira Island? It is a landmark, but whose landmark? Does yeah. it acknowledge the city? Uh, the, yeah, the state has uh, reclaimed it as a, a architectural uh, a architectural survey of India monument. But when we went, we saw the condition in which it is lying, mm. and by chance we met the man who was uh, taking us around the island. And he said that my ancestors are from Africa. Mm -hmm. And by, this was by completely by chance. We went to his home mm -hmm. and his name was Maharashtrian Gotekar. Mm -hmm. So you, we couldn't identify him, but somehow you got the vibrations <laughs> that he is someone we need to talk to. And we filmed him mm -hmm. in his home. And there we were. The family talked about uh, coming from Dar es Salaam. Somebody even went back to Africa. What a rich tapestry we discovered uh, mm -hmm. by happenstance. So, yeah. So, to uh, 
uh, build on Jasmine's um, uh, comment, the Siddhi Sayed Mosque, I visited with a, a Siddhi man whom Jasmine knows also. His name is Farooq Siddhi. And he took me uh, to several other monuments. He was very aware that Siddhis were not invited and not a single Muslim was uh, invited by Pres uh, Prime Minister Modi. Oh. And he took uh, Abe, Shinzo Abe, the Japanese minister around the mosque himself. And uh, I co-wrote this article uh, with another scholar, uh, Sonal Mehta, who lives in Ahmedabad and works with Eklavya. Uh, she and I both, of course, immediately theorized that uh, Modi wanted to distance himself from his Hindutva image mm. and claim that the Siddhi Sayed Mosque is very much a national mosque. But excluding Siddhis and excluding Muslims was a big comment. <laughs> and, and the young Siddhi said, what, is, what does heritage mean? Nobody is looking after the mosque. The, the Jali, the lattice which you showed, um, Sheila, mm. so beautifully in your film, um, is, is really falling apart. Mm. And, and Sonal and I talked to a, an architect who said, we urgently need to address this mosque. Mm. If this is a heritage monument, we need to uh, do something about it. And, and I know that Jasmine also wrote that at one point, it was a symbol of the city and the municipality of Ahmedabad. But then they changed the symbol to a chabutra, a bird feeder, feeder right, Jasmine? Uh, you wrote uh, about that. So the politics of uh, majoritarian Hindu culture somehow is woven into uh, the histories and, and the Siddhis are not sitting back. Uh -huh. They are making their own documentaries. Farooq is making his own documentaries and is very eager to now, like Sheila, over the years you have been working on this documentary. <laughs> yeah. we, we've, uh, you know, connected over translations, we've connected over people. Uh, he's determined to put a documentary together. And I think that uh, one of the scholars, Nilima Jaichandran, gave him a camera. And that has been so beneficial. Wow. So, if uh, Mira, I hope I, I kind of went off at a tangent, but I hope that answers your question. Um, and I, I know that Jasmine is doing a lot of research in Ahmedabad. So she's the person to talk about in terms of Ahmedabad. Hiroshi, you had a question for Sheila as well. Yeah, yeah. I wanted uh, to uh, tell, ask Hila, uh, Sheila, it, the healing aspects of the most of, of most of the ceremonies are emphasized. Yeah. So, uh, Sheila, if you can talk a little bit about that, and the, because the dancing and the music in India is also interpreted as healing. Uh -huh. So, if you would like to comment on that, yeah, you know that's one of the int well, the 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 spiritual trance phenomenon was one of my introductions to the African diaspora when I was about eight and went to a church in Newark, New Jersey, where these ladies got happy, and I wanted to know what is that, and I then got a sense of that it was an African continuum when I went to um, ceremonies for the Orishas in Bahia in Brazil. Okay, but then. I went to a ceremony in Morocco. <laughs> and of the, it was it was called the uh, what the the Ganawa Ganawa people. And then in East Africa, there's the czar. I saw a little czar, and that word continues as far as I think Iran czar, mm -hmm. um, and uh, it's in Turkey czar, and they're all healing. In mm -hmm. Senegal, there's the Ndu. Um, and so often the whole, the, what is, the person has some problem that is interpreted as spiritual. And what do you do about it? Well, often it involves motion. I mean, you don't just pray. <laughs> um, I mean, the, you know, the spiritual being wants to move in some kind of way. And in, in the, the movement is different in different places. Like it's very choreographed in Bahia in some places, but not all. Um, you know, they're very specific motions and others, no, this is in Brazil. So yeah, I saw a lot of movement. The one time I went to the to, um, 
uh, to Ratampur. Mm -hmm. <laughs> and I was told, you know, this is all healing. Well, isn't that interesting that all over the place, this very similar mm -hmm. uh, perspective is there. And I just think it'd be wonderful to get folks from different versions of this behavior and this philosophy of the universe together to talk about similarities and differences and you know find find out what it's about yeah very much so very much so and you've already given a lot of direction in your film <laughs> i i love your film it's so rich and oh, has thanks. so much to offer yeah it's years of work yes it is it's definitely years of work yeah so I, i'd like to ask one Quick question by way of my partner um, who asks um, Dr. Sheila Walker um, about um, uh, the, your history or your knowledge of the African diaspora community in East Asia. East Asia, me? <laughs> I don't think I'm qualified to answer that. Okay. I wish I were. Um, East Asia, uh, I'm like, a little confused. Which countries? Sheila would be able to answer that. Which countries? Yeah, China, Japan. China, Japan, yeah, et cetera. Well, there is a community called, I don't know how to pronounce it in Chinese, Wa. That's the closest I can come. That is an African descended community, someplace in, in China, that's one of the 51 or some number like that of you know, accepted minorities. And I have a photo of a rapper <laughs> from that oh. community, <laughs> interestingly enough. So, you know, his job is to also be um, uh, enter an entertainer. And I met a, a Barbadian student at a university in Shaman. Um, and he traveled around, he's a student there. He, speak Chinese, he speaks Chinese. And he said he went to someplace, and I don't know where, in, huge China. And there were all these Afro-Chinese who were fascinated by him and wanted him to stay, be a part of them, procreate to make more of them. <laughs> and, you know, he couldn't really do that. But um, so, you know, there, there's, and there's, um, oh, I, the, the UNESCO General Histories of Africa, mm -hmm. there's a, um, a Chinese scholar who has written about the African presence in China. Um, and I wish his name would come to me right now, but it's not going to. Uh, mm -hmm. Yeah. <laughs> thank, you, thank you so much. Yeah, sorry to put you on the spot there. My, my partner yeah. was curious to learn. Um, so uh, we're nearing our time. I want to give a really big thanks to Dr. Sheila S. Walker for um, sharing um, your research and including the filmmaking work and um, just a wealth of knowledge and information on global connection. I want to give a big thanks to Janelle for uh, being part of this session and um, your knowledge and direction as well throughout the process for this event. And a big thanks to Savak and Tolin, um, as well as the OHC, Oregon Humanities um, Center uh, for funding this series. So I wish you a re all really great evening and yeah, take care. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you very much. Bye, everyone. Take care. Bye. Bye. Everyone. Nice to see you. Yeah. Great to see you all.